And now, last but not least, in this session, um, we will listen to Dr. Namokulo Kovic from International Livestock Research Institute and Director General's representative to Ethiopia in Addis Ababa. Most welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to speak at this summit. Um, yeah, and the first time I've been inside a real castle, so making some personal history here. Um, my presentation is going to focus on food systems transformation, and specifically I will take an African perspective in terms of where we are now and where we could be going uh, instead. I want to start with my key messages um, to you and then go through the presentation and hopefully you will still agree at the end that these are my key messages. So the first key message that I have for you is that Africa has multiple food systems challenges. There's plenty of them. I think um, Patricia did mention uh, some of them. But also that we do have opportunities that we can now leverage, uh, such as the current uh, food systems momentum that we have seen that have been brought about by the UN Food Systems Summit and the manner in which the continent and the countries on the continent have responded to that. But that for this to actually happen, for us to be able to harness these opportunities that are presenting, we need all actors to actually be more deliberate about the efforts that they make uh, to generate uh, synergies and to be able, as a result of that, to generate some collective momentum, not only within countries, but across the continent. And hopefully, I even dare say, perhaps be uh, a lesson to other parts of the world. So the, I start with the theme uh, for this summit, uh, which is healthy lives from sustainable uh, food systems, which takes me to what the African continent looks like in terms of outcomes at the moment. We certainly have a double burden of malnutrition. Uh, on the undernutrition side, it is reflected by these high levels of stunting that we still see on the continent. We've seen some reductions in averages, uh, continental averages, but not fast enough to reach the SDG targets that we have set. While in the under five children, we are doing a little bit better uh, for exclusive breastfeeding, for example, we are doing not too badly, but we still need to do even better. We can already see, if you look at girls five to 19 years old, an increase in prevalence of overweight. When by the time we get to adult women, the situation is actually quite bad and is no different to some of the global north countries. And in some countries like South Africa, Ghana, the levels of overweight and obesity are indeed very high. South Africa tipping the scales around 65% of women overweight or obese. So yes, we have a problem. These are the nutrition outcomes of the prevailing health systems. And this overweight and obesity just doesn't come like that because it comes loaded with diet-related non-communicable diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, and the like that we are seeing increasing prevalence of. But we are seeing those increases against the background of health systems that are not equipped, as well equipped as those in the global north to deal with them. So my next item that I want to look at is the fact that Africa's food systems are characterized by multiple challenges, but also strengths that we should leverage uh, with this momentum of food systems transformation that has started. We are quite vulnerable to trade in staple foods. This is from FAO stat data. 
showing how dependent we are on staple food imports. And here I'm showing maize and rice, with the red being the levels of imports that we've been having over the years, and gray line, that gray uh, line showing the deficit. This is the same even for wheat. So you can imagine with the current food crisis that has emanated from the Ukraine-Russia war, we are extremely vulnerable, and these food prices that are going up are making what was a bad situation uh, even worse. But we are also at the same time working, trying to intensify our agricultural production, and fortunately, that is bringing challenges too, because we are going in the same direction that the global north has gone, where we are bringing on board monocultural practices, bringing on board use of fertilizers for a good reason, but we're doing it at a time when our knowledge systems actually are subject to us being able to use them uh, not so effectively but then also pesticides are also coming on board. And indeed, on the livestock sector, as we intensify livestock production, I'm using poultry here as an example, the use of antimicrobials and pesticides there as well are increasing. In fact, as I walked in this morning, I met a young man there from Zambia, if you can stand up so they can see you, who said to me, he's doing his PhD in Zambia, working on antimicrobials um, in the farming, in the poultry industry in particular. What this is doing is adding residues uh, to our food basket that we are, our, our standards bureaus are not equipped to handle at the moment but it also reduces the diversity of our food system. And within this context, the International Livestock Research Institute that I work for and the CGIR at large are really working to try and find sustainable solutions to be able to increase food production and limit the, uh, the hazards that may come with that. You've seen the, the plate of the planetary uh, dietary uh, guide that F uh, Francesco showed us earlier. This is what it looks like for the African continent on average. So you can see that for a lot of the nutrient-dense foods, we are not consuming enough. There are some like uh, tubers where we've gone off the scale, but I think that's probably from things like cassava that are consumed in a lot of amount. Um, beef is at the planetary boundary, but that simply reflects the diversity of the continent if you take a, a continental average. While some have very little, there are indeed others that are already tipping the scale. And this is happening in a continent where we still have a very rich uh, food biodiversity. And, and on this slide, you are seeing uh, caterpillar, mopani worms, uh, you're seeing uh, okra, some dried fish, uh, termite ants, uh, millets and sorghums. So we still have quite a, a wide biodiversity of food on the continent that we are still consuming. So we haven't let go of the insects yet. We haven't let go of the different types of foods that could add variety depending on what we do with our food systems transformation. Now, you've seen in the Lancet uh, uh, sketch that I showed you that we consume very low amounts of animal source foods. And we are trying to promote consumption of animal source foods, in particular among young children and pregnant and lactating mothers for the nutrient uh, requirements that they have. So when you see at this, at this graph, the percentage growth in demand on livestock products, if you consider Sub-Sahara Africa, the SSA fourth bar uh, in each one of those graphs, we are seeing much greater growth in demand than high-income countries. 
What this implies is that we need sustainable solutions to increase production within the limits of our planet so that we use ourselves because we are only beginning to increase our productivity levels, we offer an opportunity to take a different trajectory in the types of production practices that we uh, then engage in. And here I want to show an example of the, the, the situation of an egg seems like, oh yeah, an egg a day for a child, easy, cheap, that is unaffordable. And so we need really to think in terms of what can be done differently in these contexts. And this is an example of a study that was done in, the, in Ethiopia uh, between US, UNICEF, um, the Addis Ababa University and, and others, where they looked at, okay, so if an egg is too expensive, what can we do for complementary feeding? A child a seven-month-old child does not eat to consume a whole egg. And so producing egg powder, you can now add the egg to the complementary food by the teaspoon. And by doing so, they were able to show that they could reduce the cost of the complementary diet by at least 14%. The question then is, are there others um, sort of like more sustainable, perhaps, uh, innovations that we can think of that can help us get better nutrition, but not necessarily inflating the cost at the same time. So these are areas where we need um, solutions within the context that we face. This is actually almost a tongue-in-cheek uh, example that I am going to give you. And essentially what I want to paint a picture of is the fact that even on the African continent, we do have people that are already overindulging. And this was a, a, a tweet that I saw uh, of somebody, actually an institution, Digital Events, that was inviting people to the Zambia Agricultural Show. Um, and it says, who are you coming with? Um, the food market, and there's a nice plate of food there to attract people to come. So as a nutritionist, I look at that and I go, oh, dietary transition, that's not where we want to go. And so I responded. Um, very politely to whoever the person that wrote the tweet was to say uh, yummy food because I love the food that is given there. But for better nutrition and health, the amount of space taken by the sausage and the fish on this plate should be the sausage, uh, should be the vegetables. The space taken by vegetables now should be the sausage and fish that would contribute to shifting to sustainable consumption patterns. Um, I wasn't sure if the person was going to respond, but they responded to say, thank you very much. We will encourage the people who come to, lead to, to balance uh, their plate better. Um, the point is the fact that while we strive to increase um, animal source food consumption, we should also balance on the other side, um, increase energy intake to ensure that our consumption patterns do not swing the pendulum too far. And this offers us an opportunity as a continent to actually do better. So the, the, the difficulty that we are in my own view is we should take it an as an opportunity to set a trajectory that I can actually uh, do us better on, on food systems transformation to bring on board better nutrition and health outcomes, which means context is always important and equal treatment is not always what is needed. We need to learn lessons uh, from the global north so that our transition, our transformation process can actually take a different trajectory. So I said we do have opportunities for positive food systems transformation, 
And, and these are embedded within the current momentum from the UN Food Systems Summit. Multiple African countries have developed food systems transformation pathways. The African Union has looked at the different um, transformation pathways and looked at commonalities among them and developed a common position uh, on the UN Food Systems Summit. The opportunity this provides is that we've got multiple countries, and I always remind people that Africa has got 54 countries, 55 depending on who's counting. Um, it's, a, it's really quite a number of countries, so to be able to get all of them coalesce around one common um, position on food systems transformation, in my view, is an, an unprecedented opportunity for us to do better, but that depends on how we leverage this opportunity. Amongst those 55 countries, only nine currently have food-based dietary guidelines, uh, three of which countries are not even happy with the guidelines that they have. Um, I think the fact that we have so few countries with uh, food-based dietary guidelines is not something to be sad about today. Rather, it is an opportunity because it means the majority of African countries are going to develop their food-based dietary guidelines within this new context of wanting to have food systems transformation where we want better diets in the future. To me, this is an opportunity that we can leverage to actually have guidelines that speak to the current momentum, that speaks to where we want to go. And I use Ethiopia now as an example of this. For the food systems transformation pathway of Ethiopia, this is the vision that has been set to guide that process. A holistic transformation of Ethiopia's food systems from production to consumption that promotes enhanced food safety, nutrition and diets, improved livelihoods, greater land preservation and restoration, and greater resilience to shocks and stress. I'm sure you can hear what Francesco was talking about in his presentation, and you can hear some echoes of what Patricia was talking about earlier as well. They go on to say, we seek to transform our food systems using sustainable and healthy diet-centered lens that minimizes trade-offs through calling for strong collaboration across food systems actors uniting around a common goal of healthy and sustainable diets for all. Such a vision can be used as a North Star to guide different food systems actors in their efforts to contribute better towards better diets from a transformed food system. And so this is why I'm saying to you that the recent momentum from the UN Food Systems Summit, because of the manner in which countries are responding, could actually be used as an opportunity to set a different uh, trajectory. There is also this um, framework that emerged out of the UN Food Systems Summit, looking at how we might monitor food systems transformation at country level, but also be able to compare across countries. Different uh, thematic areas, diets, uh, nutrition and health, uh, environment and climate, livelihoods, poverty and equity, and then cross-cutting thematic areas of governance and resilience. This too provides an opportunity for changing trajectories because it means we can actually uh, have some level of accountability to the transformation uh, promises that we are actually making. Now for the African continent, 
This is also being looked at as in the comprehensive Africa agriculture development program that most African countries are implementing. Their CADEP biannual review process is taking up some of these indicators to include and embed as part of monitoring that common Africa position that I talked about. This to me is an unprecedented opportunity for us to be able to do things different. Which brings me back to my key messages again. That indeed Africa has multiple food systems challenges. But that we also have opportunities that we can leverage such as the current food systems transformation momentum that bring about uh, posit that could bring about positive change. However, this will take place only if all actors are deliberate about generating synergies for collective momentum. Thank you. Thank you so much, Namakulo. I have so many questions. Starting off with the speaking of context, you said um, sort of here living in the northern countries and there's a lot of focus on meat or reducing meat consumption uh, for climate reasons. So given the importance of livestock for many people, especially those in poverty, do you feel that you need to argue for, for the, the whole livestock holding in this climate focused media debate? Yes, I think we also have, um, as a continent, we also have a role to play. Um, when you look at charts, it looks like we are not emitting a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. But I think because of the low productivity levels that we have, a glass of milk produces more greenhouse emissions for us than it would here in the global north. So already just by looking at improving our productivity levels, we can actually mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But at the same time as well, there is work that is taking place looking at uh, greenhouse gas emissions are not the same in every context. So we have people, for example, at the International Livestock Research Institute that are currently estimating greenhouse gas emissions under different contexts. But in addition to that, they are also looking at different feeding regimens as well, different types of forages, because most of our livestock are forage-based. Um, so they're looking at combinations of different forages as well to address greenhouse emissions. So yes, we still do need to leverage the high nutrient density of animal source foods for our, particularly our children and uh, mothers. But we also need to remember that livestock for many settings on the African continent are not raised as food. They are an asset, a bank account. Um, I went to school with my mom saying that cow for next year's school fees. Um, so there is that level. There is also, I think Pat Patricia made reference to it. There are, there are many settings in the Horn of Africa, in the Sahel, where crop agriculture is not even an option. So what we need for them is what are the sustainable uh, livestock solutions that they could depend on because the grain that they purchase, they will actually sell livestock to buy wheat, to buy other grains. So they may even in some of the pastoralist settings, they, they may also have very low consumption of meat because it's not primarily raised for meat. Mm. The second item is the fact that um, we still have significant uh, swaths of places on the continent where animal draft power is important. Again, in those circumstances, what are the solutions? If you take away the livestock, they won't even produce the crops. So I think it is important to think in terms of context. 
Yes, greenhouse gas emissions are a real challenge, but let's look at them in context and look for contextual solutions. Great, thank you. And, and I, I will ask you an, another question also, because I thought it was so interesting when you showed uh, how you're moving from from a sort of a previous system into a more monocultures, more, more input system. What is the drive that, that takes you down this path? Economics. <laughs> Primarily, I think it's economics. Agriculture is a livelihood. And so we, we have transitions from um, subsistence farming. You can still all see all those. Subsistence, smallholder, large-scale farmers. And so it's, you want to make your livelihood um, better, earn more money, you transition. But in that transition, it offers opportunities for us to say, is there a different way of doing things? I mean, here in Europe, you are already experimenting with different ways of raising livestock within the climate context that we face now. The question that I ask is, should we follow in your footsteps or should we leapfrog <laughs> to the solutions where uh, you are going? Mm. Because those are the things, those are some of the questions that we really need to ask to say, can we, le we use the, the, the level of development that we are at as an opportunity to do better? So that researchers, you want to try out some solutions? We're ready for that. Um, Ethiopia has got a platform they call the Sakota Declaration, which I really love. Um, and essentially, they want to eliminate stunting but they've taken a food systems approach. Um, and they have said, they started off with an innovation phase where they said to development partners and everybody to say, if you want to try out solution, come try. I mean, they have to do something anyway, so you might as well try something. And those solutions that are working, they are picking up just like that. Multiple countries are trying to do the same. So for me, the message in an environment like this is that, yes, we're not as highly developed, but that's an opportunity for us to take a positive trajectory in development. Great. Thank you so much.